Welcome back to North London's Most Road, episode 18, a North London derby edition, a 2-1 win for Arsenal against Tottenham. Happy feelings at the moment for me, Jamie. How are you feeling? I'm over the moon, man. I'm over the moon. Yeah, me too. First time we cover it, 100% win rate as long as we've done the podcast. It's all us. All us. And it was a resilient game, man. Had to come back from the bottom and do it all again. Even though we were the better team anyway. But you know what I mean? Like, it shows, like, we didn't just give up. We didn't fold. We didn't bend. Even though no fans were in the stadium, came through with the resilience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big time, big time. Especially the news before the game about Aubameyang as well. That was that put me on edge a little bit. You know? Yeah, I'm surprised that... I mean, we shouldn't suggest that the captain isn't bound by the same rules as everyone else and so go, like, you know, you can't discipline the captain. Yeah. But it is most shocking, I guess, that the person who you're supposed to follow their example is being disciplined for stuff that they've supposedly done wrong and been late to training or whatever they're saying it is at the moment. Yeah. So, obviously, he's not immune. And that's why he's, if that's the rules that not only are fine, you don't play, then cool. Um, he should know better than anyone, unless you just want to give up your captaincy. You've got to got to be an example and the people, yeah. the one that everyone's standard is held to. So I understand why he's been it, singled out. It can't be that serious as well, because he, he made it to the bench. I mean, he's warming up at one point. Imagine. Yeah, so it can't have been anything that bad. I know they're talking about it, maybe him being a bit late to training and stuff like that. Obviously, it's unprofessional, but, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, and ultimately, we didn't need him today. So, um, But apart from the, obviously, a bang yang issue, uh, how did you feel about like, the team lineup when you saw it come out? I told you it lacked width when it came out. Um, but that's how it is when you've got... So last week, or a few days ago, we saw William play in that sort of weird hybrid left wing centre mid yeah. position that isn't, like, super offensive. And it tracks back to midfield and then... I've never seen it before. I don't know what you even call it. It's an in- what, like I it's, it's I find it interesting, but um, William has played better in that position than he has in other positions. So I think that suits him. I'm not sure. I mean, before when I saw that out, I saw I assumed that it would be Smith Rowe on the left playing that sort of weird left wing hybrid, yep. coming track in middle, um, occasionally swapping with Odegaard, and it looked like he played more with more width and. He was really good, man. So I, I, I'm cool with no width. It, being wrong with my assessment that there wasn't enough width. Um, once I saw the result and how he played, man, it was a good performance. Yeah, I was a couple of things in the team for me. I'm glad Cedric played today because I think he was excellent. He had a I good thought. game. Uh, Xhaka surprised he came back into the team. I think he played well. Someone makes quite a lot of mistakes. I feel like he, you know, you can you can either drop them or you just keep him in the team in the firing line. And you know, personally, I, I probably wouldn't have started Jack today, mm-hmm. in my opinion. But you know, it's it's a brave call by Arteta, and ultimately it worked. Uh, Odegaard and Smith Rowe. I'm not, I'm still not like a hundred percent convinced that they that they're the best options of playing together. Uh, me personally, I'd rather play one than the other. But ultimately, they both had like quite a, quite a good game today, so you, I can't be too mad about it. Yeah, and the, then you. But you haven't got much of a choice when you leave Martinelli out of the squad to go for Lacazette up front, really. So, yeah. So you bench Alba, no Martinelli still. It's it's a strange one. I don't know what's going on. Because he came back from his injury a couple of months ago. He started. A f- he was straight back in the team when he came back from his injury. He played yeah, like, he started. Started two or three games. Now he hasn't featured at all in seven or eight games. Especially, even when we've had like two games a week. It's, it's a bit crazy. He's ideal for these Europa League type games. Yeah, he yes. has to start on Thursday because that's tailor made for him. Otherwise, he just won't be seen again this season, Nelson style. Um, and I don't get like I don't yeah. get why you do that. Even if you want to sell someone and you hate them, which I don't think is the case with Martinelli, because I reckon he's spotless in training and he looks like the sort of yeah. obsessive Cristiano Ronaldo type that's always pushing in. You know that elite mentality of what can yeah, I do yeah, better? Yeah, what yeah. can I do better? Interestingly, Limbo did a uh, a very recent interview where he said that Saka was basically like that, always asking questions. Can we do this? Can I practice yeah. this bit? I don't think this is good. That uh, that humbleness to be able to go to be able to go. Oh, I'm you know I'm already the best in the youth team, but how else can I improve? I'm not satisfied. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. Martinelli comes across as that very determined type. So I doubt that he's got a problem in training. So what is it? People forget that he really helped us out when we were having a a mare last season. He was the one that we were looking to for support and like some sort of end product or something when things were going badly. So I feel like it's a really bad repayment of what he did for us with scoring 10 goals um, very quickly last season because he's been injured. And it's a bit weird. But now we've got, oh, you've got Willian and whatever playing. But it's like, give the kids some minutes. Willian is 33 or 32 years old. Yeah, I think, you know, 
the problems are going to be in house. We're not going to know about it. It's it's going to be kept under the radar. Arteta hasn't spoke about it in the media. But yeah, it's it's a strange decision. Should we get into the game then? Yeah. What happened there? Yeah, before we were on and before the beginning. So the game set up pretty much how I expected it to. I thought I thought we'd be on the front foot. Mm-hmm. I thought classic Jose Mourinho. Um, he'd go quite negative. Uh, go for defensively solid and try and hit us on the counter attack. Um, I was quite happy with the first ten minutes or so. I think we had control of the game. Tottenham didn't let too threaten him. But when you've got Bale, Son, and Kane, who can counter attack on you, it's always always a scary prospect. And especially where we've been losing the ball recently, I thought if they catch us, this could be quite an embarrassing game. But luckily, you know, he can't really fault our passing today. In the whole, in general, it was it was pretty decent. Um, there wasn't really any scary moments uh, passing it around at the back today, which was which is good and what, exactly what you want in a North London derby because you don't you don't want to be the player that gives away a goal like that in a North London oh, derby. Imagine, put, put it like, that way. imagine your Xhaka. Media will be mental, yeah. Like I, we, everyone roots into Xhaka for the Burnley mistake, but it would have been even worse if that was the decider in a Spurs derby, yeah. man. But yeah, so after the first fifteen minutes or so, uh, Smith Rowe hit the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, after a good start, it was a really good whip shot from the edge of the box, about 20 yards out. Hit the underneath of the crossbar, so it was very unlucky not to go in. And it kind of set the tone for us in the first in the first half. We played well, uh, but Spurs just didn't look at it in the first half. They they didn't really create much. Um, and then Sun got injured, which really really helped us out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, just quickly, like I know he's a Tottenham player, but I don't like seeing any good players get injured. Um, I'm well, it's anti-competitive to go like, way yeah. get him off because if you can't beat them with all their best players, then you don't deserve the win. Like I, I can't. I only want to go at yeah. the best that you can get. Do you know what I mean? So it's a real victory. There's yeah. no, there's no small print. There's no asterisk line to see the small print of oh, but they had whatever or whatever. Now I want to beat you at your very best, so you've got nothing you can say that ever diminishes the victory. I mean, like when when he got injured, I, there was a part of me that was like, okay, this is good for Arsenal. But like there was no part of me that was like, haha, he got injured because yeah. I'm not that way inclined. And you know, I don't like Tottenham players, like not really. But like when when a good player is a good player, regardless if it was a shit player that played for Tottenham, do you know what I mean? Like I don't like seeing players get injured. It's yeah. their livelihood uh, and all that sort of stuff. So that was a blessing in disguise for us when he got off. Um, and it, I think it did affect Tottenham because. Especially in the first game of the season when we lost to them two 0 at their ground, like well, Sun he was, was the key the man, player, yeah. yeah. And he, he, that kind of, I think that settled Arsenal even more in the game. Um, well, Lamella's not the same counter-attacking threat that Son is straight up. Like Lamella's more defensive; he's more of a shit house. So, like, mm-hmm. I understand his role in the team, but it's nothing like the end product and the difference making that that Son can bring to a team just as an individual star player. So we definitely were in better shape when he came off. Yeah. And we we did have a few chances before Tottenham's first goal. Um, I think Lacazette was squared squared a ball by Tierney um, that he missed quite badly. I think I, I'm not saying Lacazette. It was like a key chance. It was a half a chance, but he skewed it wide from the pullback from Tierney. It was a you know a, a great striker probably would have scored it, but you know I, I can't be too mad. It wasn't the easiest chance in the world. And then we'll get on to the Tottenham goal. Um, Tottenham didn't threaten at all. I think this was probably the first time they got the ball in their in our box. But classic Arsenal, um, Tottenham only need one shot and they they score. And if you're going to go 1-0 down in a North London derby, let it be a goal like that. I don't like Nemela as a player. I think he's a bit of a, you know, he's a bit dirty and he's a bit of a twat. But his you can't take anything away from his goal. He scored one, I think, three or four years ago in the Europa League, uh, which was outside the box, yeah. which was absolutely crazy. But this one was just as good when you look at the technique. Like, there was one place he could have scored when he hit the ball. And that he hit it exactly right. Like Leno was going to save it if he hit it anywhere else near the goal, but he hit it with such precision. Um, and it's an amazing goal. And if, if Spurs are going to score a goal against you, I'm glad it was that one. I don't even want to dignify Spurs goals with that sort of stuff. I get that it was a great goal in that, but still, it's nothing to me. It's nothing. You can't be a hater. Like I'm, I, don't... I choose to be a hater. I wouldn't want I to hear. Like, I wouldn't want to hear know, any like, Arsenal dislike... fan talking about I mean, or any Spurs fan talking about oh that's a great Arsenal goal nah nah, nah don't be sh- you can't be so close minded mate it's football at the end of the day he scored a great goal against us you got you can't just ignore the fact that he scored an outrageous goal and we won the like, game like that was one of on. Arsenal players who'd be going absolutely mental do you know what I mean so and we'll get our but, time you know, to go it's an outrageous man. finish <laughs> yeah so a couple of minutes later got the ball down the other end we hit the post of Cedric from about 20 yards from outside the box and I was like at that point I was like we're not going to score today. We're going to like 
dominate them, hit the bar, hit the post already. <laughs> Having with dominating possession, had like seventy percent possession, and and then I was just thinking, Kurt, Spurs are going to counter us, and it's going to go two 0 in a sec. But <sighs> luckily, about five minutes later, Odegaard got on the, on the score sheet. Um, again. again, Tierney driving, yeah, Tierney driving from the left again. How many times have we seen that this season? Pass the ball back. Uh, Odegaard's done a bit of a timid shot, to be honest, and it's taken a, a little deflection off Ardevoerd. I think that's how you say it. I can't say it properly, man. Um, As a weird and one. it's deflected in. Yeah, <laughs> it just sounds weird when you say it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it properly. I'm butchering it. But yeah, he gets a little, uh, little slight touch on it, and it takes it past Lloris. And Lloris can't do anything because the deflection's so close to him that he's got no time to react and it was it was one of them weird ones because it was probably our the worst shot that we'd put towards Tottenham's goal apart from the lacquer one when he sliced it um but it's the one that went in like ultimately <laughs> normally you've got to do it like a, a you know a decent shot to beat the keeper and his was really like slow and timid but the deflection helped us massively that's all that but matters yeah, though was a goal for half time Exactly. Well, I mean, if you hit the crossbar on post by doing like brilliant shots, you know, sometimes the the ugly shots can go in. Yeah. And that, and regardless, I don't care if Smith Rowe cracks it from twenty yards or Odegaard gets a deflection. A goal's a goal at the end of the day. Exactly, man. Uh, got us back on level terms for the first half, and I went in relatively happy with the first half. I thought we played a lot better. I feel like we should have gone in with a lead for sure when yeah. you consider the chances we had hitting the bar, hitting the post. Uh, and Tottenham just literally had one shot in that half. So, realistically, you think we should have been going in the half, like, 2-1, 3-1 up. But it wasn't to be. But at least we didn't go into the half losing. It was it was an important time to score. Yeah, I don't think you'll get even the most, like, super delusional Alpha Spurs fan saying that they deserve to be in front after that half. No, they didn't. They didn't play like they wanted to win, though. Um I mean, we'll, I'll go further in, in the second half, but if you take the first half, like Tottenham, if they won today, they're, they're, they were kind of already in the mix for top four Champions League, mm-hmm. at least top six. And they turned up against an Arsenal team who, you know, we've been in a decent form recently, but Spurs were definitely the favourites today. They're Kane, Son well, they've and Bale in for outrageous sure. form. And they, they, sh- they should have attacked us. Like Mourinho's... Classic, when he goes away from home, he sets up shop, um, tries to play on the counter-attack. But I genuinely think Spurs would have been better off in the first half, just coming at Arsenal. And then if we start picking them off, then they can default back to their negative tactics. But I, I think Mourinho's got this horribly wrong. He normally does amazingly well out against Arsenal, but in the first half, his tactics were dreadful. You love to see it. Yeah. I mean, he's, I think it's our second win in, like, 19 games against Mourinho but in um in Arsene yeah, Wenger's book he there's a bit like a stat part at the end and it shows his win rate against all the other big managers and they're all like like fine not Probably awful respectable, yeah. <laughs> and then it gets to Mourinho and it just falls off a cliff <laughs> yeah but yeah so going into the second half Saka came off at half time um, I didn't actually watch any of the you know, like Sky Sports during the halftime. I still don't know if it was so injury or tactical. I don't actually, yeah. So I, I didn't actually hear anything about it apart from the fact that Pepe was on at 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, I have been critical from Arteta in the past of not making substitutions uh, quicker. And, he, you know, he went and did one at half time today. So I can't really hate on him for that today. Um, but yeah. It's such a not so I think Arteta so- style thing to do, though. Do a half time sub of someone yeah. who, like, wasn't clearly, like, the worst player on the pitch by like 50,000 times. He wasn't great today, Saka. No, but you, that was, it wasn't It wasn't his level of, of taking off. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I feel like Saka would have definitely improved in the second half, but he's had a, he's hit a tiny little rough patch. I'm not calling it like enough to be like a proper rough patch because it's only been like three games where he's played quite poorly recently. Yeah. Um, but he's played a lot of games. Maybe he just needs a little bit of a rest. Which and is fair Spurs enough. And Spurs left back... Spurs' left back is a good left back. Let's let's not get it twisted. So he was always going to have a hard game in that position. And, you know, I've always banged on a drum about seeing Pepe a bit more in our team, see what he can do. Um, and then, you know, he got he got his 45 minutes today. So I, I can't be too mad. Especially if Saka's got a knock or something, you don't take any chances with him. You wrap him up in cotton wool. Yeah, exactly. For, he doesn't need you know, to play every game. Yeah. 
I hope he doesn't play against uh, Olympiacos, therefore, because in my opinion, it's done for if we just don't need to lose 3-0 at home. Yeah. And I think that any senior squad should be looking to win this 1-0, 2-0, 3-0, whatever, and just mm-hmm. not worry about getting injured and playing the best players. You know, you want to see people like Martinelli and you don't want to see people like Saka. Yeah. So, fair enough. It's an un Arteta style substitution to take someone off at half time. So, I do assume that there's an injury there because I just don't think that he's the type to do just reckless half and uh, half get a half half time ones like Mourinho does much more. Uh, yeah. But I'm fine with the urgency of taking someone off half time. I think it sends a stronger message. Me either. Yeah. Um, but that's the way he does it. So, we'll see how it goes with him. All right, second half. Yeah, the first, I don't know, the, the second half. We followed the same pattern as the first half really Spurs were were sitting back quite happy and content to counter us but they didn't they didn't really counter us much and not not much happened in the in the first 10 minutes the the most notable thing of note in the second half when it got to it was Bell being subbed off and Bell looks fuming we disagree but, on this yes so for me before we go into how upset Bell was and how fuming he looked like Mourinho, I think it was at the 55th minute, something close to that, has put on Sissoko for Bale. Yeah. And that just sends a message to Tottenham that we're going to go even more defensive and even more in a hole. And I, I, I don't get that substitution. That's personally. the most and loser's just, mentality sub yeah. I've ever seen. I can't believe it's he did that. It's classic Mourinho, though, isn't it? It is classic Mourinho. I, Mourinho would have taken a point, 100%. If you, if you get, offered him a point at half-time, he'd have ran out of, he'd have run out of the Emirates today. I'm telling you, 100%. <laughs> um, but, yeah, what... What do you disagree with about the Bell substitution? Well, I watched him walk off the pitch, so, and no, he was fuming. So you, I haven't seen Bell that fuming before, mate. You see that, and you say he's fuming. I see that and see disinterest. And if, if you'd seen his pressing for the first 10 minutes of the, first, of the second half, you'd have gone, this yeah. guy's not fucking bothered. And I know that he scored goals recently, and they're talking about this is turning around yeah. for him. You know, the loan is finally good showing good form. He might go on a permanent deal and... The Wade is not a problem. Real Madrid will let him go. They want to sign Haaland and Bappe. Da, 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 da. They've got their. They've yeah. now got a reason to get this six hundred grand wages off their their wage book. He's playing yeah. well. He's scoring against Burnley and Wolfsburger. The bail I saw looked like he wanted to get right back on the golf course and start taking some divots out of greens, mate. Because that nah, was just didn't look bothered. So. Walking, pressing terror. And I'm fine with that because um, you know hypothetically, if Son had not got injured and you've got say uh, Son. Kane and then Bale on four, that's a handful. But the fact that he wasn't making the same defensive sort of con- and like athletic contributions, I was happy to see. Yeah, I think with with the Bale situation is, you you can't tell me right now that if by putting on Suzuko instead of Bale, even if Bale had a poor game and looked disinterested in your opinion, that that gives Tottenham a more or attacking edge by putting on a Oh, bro, that, mate, that's not Bale my point. Bale is the kind of player... Yeah, yeah, no, but what I'm, what I'm trying to allude to is Bale is the kind of player where he might not be out for an hour, but then he might pick up a ball and bang it from 30 yards and score in the top corner. Yeah, I, I just that. feel like Mourinho was too negative with that. I feel like Kane did fuck all for the first hour. He was probably worse than Bale, in my opinion. Literally did fuck all. He did fuck all um, until the free kick at the end. Yeah. But yeah, so I, it was a strange substitution for me, especially when you've already lost Son. I feel like you have to keep Kane and Bale on the pitch. I, I, mean, I know, obviously, he did keep Kane, but I mean, like, he has to keep Bale on the pitch. They've got a decent partnership together at the moment, so I, I don't know. I think if I was Harry Kane, I'd be fucking fuming with Mourinho for what he did, in my opinion. You might see it differently. But well, Kane, Kane was already isolated, right? And he's usually the type that will drop back into Cam or, like, deep line forward and pick up balls and yeah, pass yeah. around because he's got a good passing range. Elite passing range, I'll he give really you. He does, yeah. Um, so when you leave him more isolated and he doesn't drop back he doesn't doesn't touch the ball and we saw that because he didn't really touch the ball <laughs> which I'm fine with because he's lethal man but maybe Bale would have been able yeah, to get between the lines yeah I you know I, I just felt like I, I don't think there's a lot of Arsenal fans that were like annoyed at the fact that Suzuko came on for Bale I think most of us are probably like yes this is fucking brilliant they've already <laughs> lost Son to injury and now Bell's off the pitch. They've only got Kane. And you know you can say Lamella, but you know, Lamella's not consistent. Uh, Lucas Moura was banging though. Goal, but yeah. He was he was good, he was good. But then we'll get on to the penalty. So a few minutes after Bell came off, uh Lacker's won us a penalty. Um I don't know whether I could show it skill, like intentionally air shotting a shot, um and getting the defender to clatter into you, or 
because you know I, I think it, he's got to hit that. Yeah, hit that. It's shot. a poor shot. Like, he's lucky that he gets tackled he, yeah. and fouled afterwards. It's 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 a bit of crazy defending from Sanchez. I, I, I mean, I can only allude to the fact that he probably thought Lacazette was going to score. Mm-hmm. That's why he's gone in so hard. Um, and in hindsight, if he saw what Lacazette did, he probably feels like a bit of a mug right now. But in the modern game, that's that's a penalty for me. Ten years ago, it wouldn't have been given um, because he didn't miss the shot and they'd have been like, fuck the contact afterwards. That's not a penalty. Because um, Lacazette definitely makes the most of it. I'm, you know, I, I'm critical of players like Salah and Kane who make the most of stuff. And not, I'm not going to allude to the fact they dive, but they definitely go down with the intention of winning stuff. And Lacazette did the exact, the exact same thing. We well, had to get the uh, the heat off the fact that he missed the sitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Maybe, yeah, that maybe that was even more. It was like just trying to just like, oh, fuck, like no get rid of the yeah. attention, man. <laughs> but to be fair to him, uh, he slotted the penalty away beautifully. That was pinpoint precision. No keeper in the world saving that. If you had two keepers in the goal, I doubt they'd save it. It was so accurate and such uh, a fine penalty that Larus was never saving it. And then we go 2-1. Yeah, 2-1 to Arsenal. Good. I'm feeling feeling a lot more positive now. And yeah. It it's was... where we should have been by that point. Yeah. And we caught exactly. up to expectations with that, I think. And then we could finally play a more relaxed game that we can play on the offence for and let them have to create chances. Yeah, definitely. And t- Tottenham, in fairness, when, when they went 2-1 down, they, they didn't really create much over the... Fo- the the five or ten minutes before Lamella got sent off. Um, I, I'm probably going to disagree with you with this, this sending off because for me, I'm not 100% sure he should have gone for this. Um, I saw it at real time and I, I saw he put his hand up and like to hit Tierney in the face. But when I've watched it a few times, I, I don't know, I feel like it's a bit soft. Well, you think he was just trying you know, to that shoulder to barge in it like he's too small? <sighs> I don't know. Well, he's put his arm out and it's hit Tierney in the face. Don't get me wrong, but he's put his hand. I don't feel like it was. Don't get me wrong. Lamella's a dirty player, and he's you know he's a bit of a wind up and all that sort of stuff, and he's a bit ferocious and tenacious player, which there isn't too much wrong with. Um, but it always leads to being more able to get red cards and yellow cards in games. Xhaka's a similar player, um, but for me, I, I, I'm just not convinced he should have gone for that. Mm-hmm. But. You know, if you put your arms on someone's face in a game, you're always running the risk of getting a yellow card or a red card. And ultimately, he went. And the the strangest thing is that it made it made Tottenham play better. It did. So it really did. If anything, it kind of it kind of helped them. It sparked them back into life. What I will we were say tragic that, over the last fifteen minutes. What I will say is that I uh, when it was first given, I was like, okay, cool, perfect. And then on the replays, I was less sure. But then the commentators thought it would be a straight red with like violent conduct. So I don't know really what to think because nah, no that's they know better than me. And But I know that I've been in that position playing football where you're trying to hold someone off and you're just grabbing on, trying to get a shoulder or yeah. whatever to, to use your body weight against theirs. And if they're smaller than you, you can catch them without meaning to, just in the neck, in the face, whatever. Like yeah. Because, just because... And to be honest, I think Lamel is the same height as Tini. They're both about 5'10". So I don't know why he's like done that or how he's managed to. But I just know that like you can be just... like be too rough of people not even out of choice because you're just trying to keep balance and you're trying to keep people off you and shoulder them and shield the ball um I'm not trying to make excuses for Lamella here perhaps he should have been sent off even before that from yellows that weren't given for the amount of fouls and I, stuff yeah, he I, did I do think yeah the accumulation of, of fouls and just when you're a tenacious player like these Lamella Jacker type players you run the risk of doing something where say if Harry Kane or Lacazette did this they would probably be less inclined to get a yellow card, but because they've got that temperament of being a bit, they got a reputation, yeah. They're more like they're more likely to get a yellow card. It's like when a player is renowned for diving, he's less likely to get penalties because he's got that reputation, yeah. of going down too easily, and it's it's a similar thing. I, agree. I think the good thing, and whether and whether you see it as a good thing, uh, Tierney's milked it, of course, but so many teams have done that to us over the years that I can't be too mad about it. I'm not, you know, I'm not mad at Kieran Tierney for his reaction or going down too easily and making the most of it because so many teams would have done it to us that it's kind of, it's kind of fair treatment at this kind of point. I don't think anyone doesn't go down after getting hit in the face now in the Premier League. I don't think it's like an aberration. I think it's the standard. Yeah. I don't think anyone doesn't. No, I, I just think in the past, like, can you imagine, you know, 
Roy Keane Vieira, if one of them did it to the other one, <laughs> there's no way they're going down. Or but I'm hanging on to you know old, old school things where the modern game has moved so far forward that that that's it is probably and on, on the balance of probability, it's probably a yellow card in the modern game. It's probably more the fact that we don't want it to be a yellow card because if that was an Arsenal player doing that, would have been a bit pissed off. But it is what it is at the end of the day. So we, I would say, with the refereeing decisions, we did get quite lucky. Um, not saying we didn't deserve to win the game, but all of the major decisions in the game kind of went our way. We had a bit of lady luck today, I think. Had a few soft free kicks given on their end at the end of the game that on some days are, some days aren't, that ended up being very stressful and deadly. Um, but overall, so yeah, stressful. we can talk about all the little things and little things and little things. But um, yeah, I understand yeah. that. And if that had gone in, we'd feel wrong because they were very so soft free kicks. Definitely. So when Kane scored that goal, um, his header, it was actually a really good header, I'll give him that. I was sweating, man, because as soon as they put it, it was offside, I was like, okay, okay, cool. it's offside, we're fine, we're fine. And then when you've just got to wait for the VAR, you're like, oh, shit. It was clearly offside, was offside? but I was and just, start... like, I just thought the yeah. VAR was going to oh, no, get when I saw the Yeah, when I saw the replay, I was like, yeah, he's 100% offside, but but it's before the replay. I'm talking about them, like, 10, 15 seconds before the, yeah, yeah. the replay. And you're like, fuck, the amount of VAR shit that's happened to us recently, it's just going to go in. It's going to be classic. Like, 10 men Tottenham are going to get a fucking draw away from us. Um, <laughs> and Marino's going to be yeah, grinning. So normally, he was offside. Um, then they got another free kick, uh, which Kane <laughs> nearly scored from again. Um, hit the post. Gabriel was our saviour, clearing it off the line. I think it was Sanchez uh, trying to get, make up for his penalty that he gave away from Lacazette. But Gabriel's right place, right time, because Leno's not saving that rebound from that free kick. Yeah. Um, it was, And it was great defending. And he's basically won us that game he was solid that whole game like even really in the good. fact that he was willing to come out from centre back to intercepts like balls that were coming in towards yeah. our half and just snuff out stuff before they were ever a problem and you'll never see him like 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds later having to make a tackle or making no. a mistake because he snuffs it out pre like worry and that also means that you yeah. can come and play it back at them when they're not quite in position so what he does isn't just great defensively he also gives you a leg up offensively because he can make those forward movements and predict and read the game well enough to intercept things before they ever come through. And I thought he was so solid today. Absolutely. I want to shout out David Luiz as well because, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, he's made high profile mistakes, but when David Luiz is 100%, he's an amazing defender. And I don't think anyone can really disagree with that. Um, our defence was solid today. When you limit a team like Tottenham with their attacking capabilities to a outrageous goal, um, that most defences would have conceded. Even probably Man City would have conceded that goal. And then a Harry Kane shot on the post and then a rebound that was cleared off the line as Tottenham's pretty much three only chances in the game. Yeah, You've got to consider the fact that your defence and even your midfield jacker and party have done ridiculously well on the defensive side of the game. Yeah, I bet Harry Kane's embarrassed to have been that taken out of the game and it's all down to good defensive work and you know snuffing and suffocating people out, man. Yeah, I, th- I think we we did go into a bit of a shell when we they went down to 10 men. And I just, I wish we went a bit more positive. I know you can say, you know, it's a North London derby, a lot's at stake, but we, we let Tottenham do that to us at the end of the game. Maybe you can say that, you know, Tottenham let us do what we did to them in the first 75 minutes because they were content to sit back. Uh, but we, we did a Tottenham basically in the last 15 minutes. You think we invited the pressure onto ourselves? We did, 100%. There's no way that a team goes down to 10 men and gets <laughs> a team just gets... Get, and 11, 11 the, the other teams are saw today, just get worse. Yeah. Like, through nothing other than a shift of mentality. We definitely just let them have the ball thinking, oh, they're not going to be able to do anything now that they've got 10 men. But when Kane's on the pitch, you've always got a chance. Ultimately, today they didn't. It was very stressful towards the end and I was fucking... Ma- major, major stress for me. Um, but oh yeah. no, we got there, got the job done. Three points. I know it's in the league, probably not got too much to play for in the league, but it's bragging rights at the end of the day. Absolutely, hundred uh, percent. It, it's good confidence. It keeps us our forward momentum. If we go into Olympiacos, get another win, we're going to be in good stead for the Europa League. And you know, let's see what happens in the Premier League. If we win eight out of our next ten games in the Premier League, we might qualify for Europe. You know what I mean, we have to see what happens. Yeah, well, we, we have to win teams. today. And the teams in the top four are, are, are so inconsistent as well. Let's not let's not forget that. Um, that. If we did have a really, really, really good run of form, 
we can get ourselves in and amongst it. But I'm not relying on that. Europa League's the priority for me. Yeah, I think it's a bit it's a bit difficult to say we can still qualify because we can theoretically. But yeah. we've said this a, a few times before when we've won a game, especially a game that we don't usually win. For example, today. For example, the Leicester game. Um, and we've gone. You know what? We're only X many points off. It was eight or ten or eleven or whatever it was now and whatever it was then. So we just need to win like eight out of ten games, which is all fair enough. But then we'll draw against Burnley or something and then it's right and all our good work is undone. And it's just so difficult now with only nine or so games left to to really go, OK, well, we just need to win all of them. Yeah, but no one wins those all of those games. It's, it's difficult. It's going to take a lot of mistakes and impeccable zero mistake play from us to get into even a chance of getting top four at this point. It's almost done for, I yeah. think. Um but I don't want to be a cynic. I don't want to go, oh, there's no way, because you have to see what the what the future brings and what we can do and what we can string together. But absolutely, the Europa League is the most important. Luckily, we do seem to have a pretty easy, clear run now because we did the work in, in Athens to be able to get through and bring it on, man. Let's, I want to see, like I said before, I'll say it again, I want to see Martinelli. I'd love to see Aziz. I'd love to see Balogun. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not, not saying like a piss taking, oh, we don't respect these guys and playing people out. But around first team players, you know, give them a run out, give Sabayos a run out. Give give Callum Chambers a run out. I want to see yeah. you know the players that Rob Holding come back in the squad and show that they can be solid as well because I think it's unfair that people like him have been sidelined just because the other defenders have been playing well. I understand yeah. why, and I'm can't I'm not you know I'm I'm not going to complain about Gabriel yeah. and Louise having a great game like they did today. But it is just that you want to see I want to see rotations. I want to see people rested. I want to see Saka not play. I want to see Lacquer again. I want to see Martinelli. I don't want to see Smith Rowe. I don't want to see Odegaard. I want to see the other players come in and do some damage. And hopefully a few young players make the bench. And I understand he's not just going to randomly start Aziz because imagine if they lost 3-0, his head would roll for that. Yeah. Um, but I want to see these kids on the bench. So if it does get to 60 minutes in and we're 1-0 up, let's see what they can do under pressure, man. Because pressure is what you you need to get used to as a as a senior player. And if we are serious about having um, a real way and a real blooding process to go from youth team to first team, we have to take these little risks and put people in where perhaps they're not completely ready and see if they can fly. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think, yeah, a lot of rotation should come against Olympiacos on Thursday night. I saw a stat as well uh, for Arteta that says that he's now beaten all the top six managers in his short time as a manager, okay. which is which is a good stat. And I think over the... Arsenal notoriously don't win the big games. Yeah. Um, I know that we've most of our wins against the top six teams this season have come at home, so you know it. it we we still have a bit of a problem away from home against the top six, but we, we seem to be winning more games against the top six since I think Emery had didn't have the worst record either. I think it's Wenger had a bit of a bad record towards the end, and I think we we're we're slowly beginning to realise that we can win the big games now. Yeah. It's just that it's just the the silly little games against Crystal Palace, Aston Villa. Burnley's that we need to work on and if, if we'd have won a few more of them we'd be right in the race for top four so there, there are improvements um, and it's you know it's not all doom and gloom in the league but you know it realistically if you beat Tottenham today 2-1 it doesn't mean shit if you're going to lose 3-0 to Aston Villa exactly and we undo it every time and I but also want to say seven. that um you can't really fault the team for a lot of these things either. It's just been dumb individual things that have undone all the good work against top teams like Leicester. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm you know I'm talking about the Xhaka mistake. I'm talking about other mistakes. It's just no. You can definitely you need to, fault the teams. You, but we've drawn a game because of a goal that's directly happened because of something stupid, and it's just frustrating to think that we could have had two more points here, two more points here. You know, whatever we could have saved a point here rather than just those aberrations costing us and they don't other teams don't make that level of mistake so what like sure it's it's just tightening up yeah there's there there are a few positives in the season there's probably more negative than positive let's not forget that <laughs> there was also an awful run where we won like one game in 10 that was painful and we were losing to everyone so you know when you have your highs they're high when you have your lows they're lows so let's not just forget that just because we're on a really good run yeah. obviously you want to stay positive and you want to be confident and you want to see like you're going in the right direction but you can't forget what happened earlier in the season 100%. and it did cost us and we should have learned from it as well and at least yeah. gained some resilience out of having to come back from that i hope we see these guys come back mentally stronger and don't repeat that again no me too no i completely agree with that so should we get into some questions then or have you got anything else you want to cover during the game mate 
I'm good with the game. I'm so glad that the game is done and I'm ready to leave it in the past as we squander more points to relegation level teams. <laughs> well, hopefully not soon. <laughs> yeah, let's we'll get on to the questions, we'll man. Let's get on to the questions. Okay, I've only got a couple today because um, I knew it was a big game, so I wanted to just cover a few. Yeah, yeah. Um, we got this one on a, a YouTube video comment from Big Man A4, who's been a, a big fan for us, and I, I rate his... Uh, the time he spends on our channel and watches a lot of our videos. Um, yeah, yeah. One of our biggest fans so far, I'd say. Yeah. Very, we're very grateful for the for. Yeah, always, always commenting, always positive for the support, always backing us up. Yeah. And also, f- at Fabio Gucci's on Instagram, who yeah. designed us a, a thumbnail completely unprovoked, just decided to do that out of his, you know, using his skills, and he said he enjoyed our podcast. So, that's the the two that come to mind. The two people yeah. that have done like there's given lot, us the most support at the beginning. Well, yeah. But we that doesn't mean we don't appreciate everyone else that we haven't read the names out of and, and complimented on here. But we really appreciate that. A four did clown one of my intros though, so let's not, be, <laughs> let's not get let's not give him too much love. A four. Uh, anyway, so A four has asked, uh, "What got you to support Arsenal?" Is the first part of his question. So I, I can go first if you like. It's up to you. I answer the whole question at once. No, because the other one's like another question, basically. So. Okay. How did you support so, Arsenal? You go first. Well, I got into Arsenal through my late mother. Uh, she supported Arsenal. And my late uh, granddad did before that. So Arsenal's just been in my family. Um, my brothers support Arsenal. You know, my whole direct family support Arsenal. It's that simple for me, really. What about you? See, you made me sound like a fraud now. Because I'm going to have to talk about my checkered family history come on spit it out so i live in north london obviously so it's basically a choice of uh, unless you want to support enfield town which i don't think anyone chooses to over <laughs> spurs or arsenal um or borham wood or whatever you know barnet one of them ones um my dad supports tottenham uh, and i support it? arsenal <laughs> because he supports tottenham <laughs> that can't be the reason no. uh, it's the reason i give it's a bit of banter so you hate uh, your dad that much <laughs> it's, it makes for good family chats over it um, but we do have like uh, we both like Fulham so we can kind yeah. of like jointly support Fulham as a second team so we go to Craven Cottage every now and then um, it's a lot easier to get tickets to than the Emirates so we have that as like a, a fullback team so I'm a big fan of Fulham's. I hope they can stay up this year they look like they're playing good football under Scott Parker but that's obviously not the question that's just me rambling um, so I, ever since I was like four and I was playing football it was just Arsenal really it's just what all the other kids in the playground were supporting that's what I and I guess it was Thierry Henry and all them yeah. look like then I was like um, when was this 2001 or something so it was all like I remember barely remember but that was just the popular the uh, not popular but like it was every all my mates supported it I wanted to support Arsenal I loved Red I was really with it, and I'm so glad that I fell in love with Arsenal Football Club and not Tottenham. Good choice. Probably slightly better for your mental health, Arsenal, but still not compared to some other teams. Because <laughs> <laughs> Tottenham fans must be going through some shit as well, like we are. But uh, the next part of the question is, uh, and which game, Arsenal game, have you been to and remember slash cherish for the rest of your life? Ooh, so... There was one against Aston Villa. It must have been just after the Emirates opened. Mm-hmm. And it was my first time at the Emirates. It was must have been not long after 2006. I barely remember it, except that, was it, Ivan Campo scored a goal and it was gutting. But like when you're young, <laughs> all the emotions yeah. are like triple fault. So when you win, it's like, you've still got that youthful excitement. And it probably wasn't even that fun at the time, but my... Long term memory of it is just so much better. There's other good games that have been happening as well, but I will have. To, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to go back to Fulham again. I went to Fulham um, when they first got promoted, and they had the terrible defence a couple of years back. And this was the the craziest game because of the downs before the up, and so it's the most memorable to me now as a recent game that I've been to. And it was the one where Kamara stole the penalty from Mitrovic and then missed it. And it was the two bottom teams going against each other. It was Huddersfield and Fulham. And so this was like, if we don't win this, we're getting relegated. And after missing the penalty, it ratcheted it up the tension so much that like everyone was going... Because if, you've, if, you've, if it's been fairly like fine and whenever, it's, there's not the same frustration. It's because there's gratitude in not losing if you've been pressed. Um, 
but we were so, especially with the penalty miss, everyone was so aggravated and the tension was so tense and it was came right to the end, almost the last kick of the game. And Mitrovic hits a terrible shot and it not makes the keeper when it goes in. And it goes crazy. And there's no euphoria like that unless you've had so much frustration before and it makes the highs like 10 times better. So I haven't had a game like that at the Emirates um, because it, we've generally just won fairly comfortably because I, they've been against like worse teams and stuff like that. Except the Aston Villa one, which is a much tighter game, which is why it's better. I like those, those difficult, hard-fought wins. Those are the most emotional. Um, like I've been to like standard like two 0 wins against Crystal Palace and stuff. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not the right. same. So no I have to hide. No? no one wants to hear your Fulham shit, man. <laughs> Talk about that. I like Fulham, but shut up. <laughs> nah, I'm only joking. Nah, fair. You got a good affection for Fulham, but Arsenal are the priority, bro. Hundred percent. I back Arsenal game. every game. No, but it was just nah. that, that, like <laughs> no, I haven't been to that emotive an Arsenal game, but I have nah, been to enough. an emotive Fulham game. So for me. Uh, Mine's a hybrid game because I went to quite a few hybrid games. I think I've been to more hybrid games than Emirates games, to be honest. Um, I don't have like a season ticket, so yeah, I don't we don't go, know like... anyone in high places, so we can only be fans from the like. The, like yeah. I, I, we'll be fifty years old by the time we get one waiting. We don't know people like that. Yeah. We're the mo- like, and so, and I don't want to just be like, oh, we're out of the. We don't, we're not the because, we, but we are. We don't know people like that. We didn't grow up knowing people that had all these things that could get us into all these games. So to go to a game was an unheard of luxury that we cherish yeah. forever. And it's not like so. Fair enough. You've got a season ticket. You managed to do that. We have no avenues to do that. We have none. We just love the club and we talk about it. Yeah. And before you hijack that, no, I'm joking. But <laughs> <laughs> right. So for me, um, I used to go to a lot of Arsenal and Charlton games because mm-hmm. my stepdad. Dad, oh, my stepdad, stepdad's stepdad squared. No, um, <laughs> was was a Charlton fan, so we went to a lot of Arsenal Charlton games at Highbury. Um, there was one where they battered us five two or five three. I think it was five three, and they had some like crazy players that beat us. But the one that sticks out for me, I think it was, I'm sure it was a four nil Arsenal Charlton. I think it was like 2005 maybe, and we beat them. I think it was four nil. Or fight something close. It was when Henry did that back hill. Mm-hmm. I was at that game. Uh, Charlton were wearing a yellow, like a bright yellow kit, and I think Arsenal were in their O2 red, but with like the yellow collar kit. I'm sure it was 2005. And Henry scored that back hill, and I've never like celebrated a goal more in my life. It wasn't <laughs> like the the more. It wasn't the kind of. It wasn't like a tense game because obviously I, we went like I'm sure we went like three four nil up within like 20 minutes. We like we went out of the blocks like really fast. So it wasn't one of the games where it was like you're buying your nails or anything like that. But it was just the euphoria of when Homery scored that back kill where everyone was just like, what? Like <laughs> everyone was just going mental like they like hands on heads like faces like ghosts like how the fuck does he do that? Um, but yeah, for me that was the game I probably remember most. I've actually remembered from something. My childhood. I remember yeah, something on. that makes it more important. <laughs> so um, like a few years back, it was it, it was an Arsenal Crystal Palace game. We won either two 0 or four 0 I can't remember the exact. Um, but I didn't have to pay nothing. This girl that I knew's dad was like a real hotshot banker, and he had like a season ticket at Arsenal, which he got because he bought an apartment near the old stadium that just came with a season ticket. And I didn't realize you could do that. Like I didn't realize that like you could get flats that came with stuff because he was buying like rental properties. Although, I don't know. I didn't really ask. I didn't really care. But when you get taken to a game, I felt like the biggest trophy wife, man. I was loving it. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my time. <laughs> and we won. It was fine. It was good. That was good. Yeah, I've, I've got one more question as well from Instagram. Um, but this is about the Olympiacos game. So I'm happy to go into a bit of pre-match, pre-match chat about the go Olympiacos. On, go on. Um, so I'll, I'll start this off from the question. So it's from Oscar Ferrari twenty four on Instagram. This is at, and he's just asked for the Olympiacos predictions. But I thought that's a nice way to segue into the next. Bit. Go on then, you go first. What did you say the Tottenham score was going to be? Did you say two one last week? No, I, I said two two. Okay, I thought you said two one. I was, ne- I was, I was going to give fair, you some props. I I was nearly right. If Kane fucking. You just wanted him to score that. Oh, I can at least no, I can I prove really myself didn't. right on the podcast. I'd much rather be wrong and us win than for them to draw and be right fuck that I'm all about Arsenal fuck like giving Tottenham any more points but yeah I, I we've got such a comfortable lead that sometimes these games can be a bit tricky to navigate I don't I'm not trying to like come with like a defeatist mentality because I don't think we're going to lose for one second but I think when you're 
so kind of certain to go through it's hard to approach a game you either approach a game where you come out of the blocks you go one nil up quite early on and it's a bit of a formality or you don't score for the first 20 30 minutes and then the other team grow into the game and then they might nick a goal and then it gets a bit a bit panicky so i'm thinking yeah rotate the team quite a lot but let's leave our big players on the bench in case at half time we need to bring them on or 60 minutes in we need to bring them on for a bit of security um i think it's going to be probably like a 2-1 win like a, a a narrow win i think i'm going to go for on thursday night i think it depends on the squad we play and knowing arteta he'll play the full strength squad for some dumb reason and not rest and then we'll lose the game of the weekend yeah. i don't understand you just you know what i mean like he, uh, i think I he's you, a I good manager you. and he's got the great culture building management man management skills it looks like and he's got the no nonsense stuff that you need to really take a toxic culture into a positive one but he makes those sorts of frustrating decisions like overplaying players in games that are just okay to hold back on that i just feel like he's going to play all the big players and we're going to really go for it and then win one two nil or something but then throw away points in the Premier League and everyone can say oh the Premier League's done I get that but I still want to be efficient and effective so I reckon he'll play good players um, and then we'll, it'll be a different score prediction than if he did what I would do which is let El Nenny start and Martinelli and co who um, well Martinelli's got goals in him I don't mean to say defensive but I mean and then hang back and don't make crazy plays that you don't need to and just play a good comfortable game frustrate them and then if they, mistakes go, they make mistakes go for it um, so I'd love to just calm it out to a 1-0, one, 1-2-0, nil, one, nil, and just leave it at that. Um, but I reckon we go for it and concede goals. Yeah, it, it's like I said before, it's a hard game to approach. I'm going 2-0. We, we, yeah, I think realistically... I don't that, want to concede. If we if we go out, it's... If we go out of this in this position, I think serious, serious, serious questions have to be asked of our I Twitter. cry. It's... It's not a game that we should even look at losing. I don't even want to lose this game and narrowly go through. Ultimately, I don't care as long as we get through, but I think mm-hmm. just for momentum, uh, positivity, confidence, we need to just keep this winning streak going. And the more wins you get, the more confidence you get, the more the players are going to believe in Arteta, they're going to believe in themselves. Uh, I And also, just considering the first leg as well, like I don't really consider Olympiacos that much of a threat going forward. I might yeah. live to regret them comments, but no, I, I agree with you. Right I just don't feel like they can really... They didn't really cause us any problems. Mm. Uh, and I don't feel like they, they've they really got that in them to come to our ground and score three goals. I, just, I don't see it, especially with how good we've been defensively. Um, as long as we don't make mistakes, then I don't really see them scoring many goals, if if not any. Yeah, I want to keep a clean sheet. I'll be really frustrated if we concede a goal, especially if it's a dumb mistake again. I'm going to go 1 or 2-0. Nil. I'll go 2-0, so I'll be positive. Yeah, I th- I'm, I'm going to go 2-1. I think we'll concede. But hope, I hope we don't, but I'm going to go 2-1. Just so I'm actually fine one nilling it, just to prove to the world that we can game manage. Like, even if it is not the most exciting. I hate to say this, but I just want to know that we can play effectively and just not expend too much energy and risk injuries for the Premier League and for the later rounds because we don't need to go crazy for this. I just don't want to concede and I want to win. So what I want to talk about also um, reminded me of him when I saw Alba warming up to not come on, but the man behind him was someone we haven't seen much of recently is big Callum Chambers. Callum. Now... Let me just run for a little bit. I did a little bit of research on this guy just to get like update my facts and see what's up with him and see what we think his future holds. Basically, so he's now 26, still doesn't have a real carved out full position. Um, he's played centre back, he's played right back, he played defensive midfield for Fulham. He's got less resale now than if we'd sold him the window that we were in for Zahar because there was all this talk about him being a swap and stuff like that the year we got Pepe about a year and a half ago. We bought him back in 2014 for £16 million pounds of add-ons. So that's almost seven years ago when he was 19 and he was a pure right-back. The right-back position was different back then, though, to what it is now. But Bellerin came through, was player, uh, team of the season in 2015-16 and kind of limited Chambers' progression. And they're different players. Bellerin was more athletic in that role. So he then he joined Middlesbrough on loan for the 16-17 season. He was a key player. Also in 2014, when we bought him, he played three times for England as a right back. So you hear the signs, you think this guy's up and coming. He's going to be our next right back. We now know he isn't. 
He signs a new contract in summer 2018 and a month later is loaned out to Fulham, which I think is a bit harsh of the club if they sort of said that they would play him as a first-team player to make him sign the contract and then shipped him straight off to Fulham. Instead of playing right-back or centre-back, they play him as a defensive midfielder. Fulham get relegated, but he wins their Player of the Year award. Fans think at the time, and I was one of those fans who thought he could be reborn into a new role after being destroyed and tortured right back for us a few times. Comes back to Arsenal, plays 14 games before December and then ruptures his ACL in December 2019 and doesn't play again until March 2021 where we've just seen him recently when he started. He's now 26. According to the internet, he has a contract until 2022. So at the end of the season, it will be a year left. What do we do with Callum Chambers? Very, very good question. (laughs) Um, For me... I don't think he's an Arsenal-type player. I don't quite think he's good enough for us. I mean, or not, not he's probably good enough for our level at the moment, but for where we want to get to, I don't think I would have him anywhere near the squad. Potentially on the bench, but definitely not a starter. Um, I just don't see what position he re- could realistically play for Arsenal. He's not going to get in at centre-back. We've got too much talent and young talent coming through that he's going to get in there. Um, he's n- not a fullback for me. He, he'd get skinned against a quick player like we saw against Swansea, that game against Swansea where he got absolutely terrorised by Montero all them years ago. <laughs> Getting bad flashbacks. I remember that, that actually. That's um, the one I remember. And he's not going to get in um, in midfield. He's just not a good enough player. Uh, I think his level is a place like Fulham and, I would, and I've got no negative things to say about Callum Chambers as a person. Um, I just don't think he's Arsenal level and there's going to be players that aren't Arsenal level and it doesn't mean necessarily mean it has to be a bad thing. He's English, he's 26, yeah, he's had some injuries, but I think we could get between 5 and 10 million for him. Uh, especially he'd be more valuable because of, you know, Brexit and needing more homegrown players. So I think we've got we've got a bit of a fee. Um I'd like I'd like to see us sell him and especially with a year left because he's probably not going to sign a new contract and I wouldn't blame him because he doesn't really play. Uh, but yeah, let's try and get a little bit of money out of him. The thing is, for me, when when the talk of us selling him after he did well for Fulham, and people were talking about this is his peak asset value, and you know trying to convince us that they were the next financial wizards of the world because they knew that we should sell this guy, yeah, were briefly wrong when he played really well and was starting for us that season, and we didn't trade him for Sahar because we got Pepe instead. At that point, people were saying. 25 million was the deal for him and it didn't happen and that season I remember um, the first game was away to Newcastle and Holding and Chambers started and we kept a clean sheet for the first day of the season and that whole season before we'd only kept like two clean sheets so to get one already was a big deal and we think okay we've got this new centre-back partnership they look pretty solid so he's shown at times that he's solid and he can play for Arsenal. Centre-back, I understand, has evolved for Arsenal now. We've got a lot more talent than we used to, and we're a lot less dodgy than we used to be. I don't trust him at right-back, though he did have good performances um, last year at right-back. So, you know what? It's unfortunate. It's difficult. He wasn't cheap when we bought him. He was considered a big prospect, and he played for England the year we bought him. Yeah. His contract is running out. And it's unfortunate he got injured and you can't predict that when you're deciding whether to keep someone, you know, two years ago. I'd like to see us get more than £10 million for him. I know that's tough, but I think he's good enough to be a £20, £25 million pound player. And if he got Premier League team Fulham's player of the season, even if you get relegated, if you're player of the season, you're most certainly a good enough team to play at a high level than that team. So he's higher than a low Premier League team. Um so. It's just difficult that he hasn't been given the run. He hasn't got ahead of people. And we've got a lot more talent now than I think we used to. And Mm -hmm. of all the positions on the pitch, I'd say 10 and right and left back have evolved the most over the last seven years since we bought him. And that's just unfortunate that your your place, your natural place can be disrupted. In the same way that jobs are getting lost because of technology, his job has been kind of lost because it's been made more dynamic as a fool and wing back to be able to cover more ground and do more yeah. stuff and be more athletically astute we'll say and um he's solid defensively man so it's just tough for him i would say that if we can get a good deal then fine but i'm okay keeping him as a squad player if we'll sign a new deal i would hate to see him just 
mm. not play many games and then leave on a free next year because it would be the most Arsenal thing and it would be the most pathetic signal to send out in the transfer market that we yeah. just let that happen. So it's just unfortunate because he's got an interesting, good career. He's performed on loan. He can't have done much more when he's left the club. It looks like he really wants to make it at Arsenal because he's gone and played well, come back, fought yeah. for a place. And unfortunately, when he really was looking good and like he would be our first choice centre-back, right back going forwards, he got the horrible injury. Yeah. So it's just difficult, man. It's it's unfortunate. He deserves better. It's 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 definitely an unlucky. He's definitely unlucky in his Arsenal career. And there's been a few players over the years where they've had that unlucky, like just when you think that they're going to get in and amongst the team, momentum, and they're going to actually cement themselves as part of the squad, they get a big injury and they mm. lose all kind of um, prospect of doing that. I've, you know, at this point of his Arsenal career. I just don't think there's any way back for him, in my opinion. Uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong. I just don't see him getting to that level where we're looking to him to start or even really feature that much. It, it's unfortunate. Um, I do wish him all the best, and I do just think he needs a fresh start, personally. To be playing week, week in, week out. Because if you're 26, you've already had a load of injuries. You're going to want to be playing week in, week out, and he's not going to get that Arsenal. So I think he's English... Let's sell him. Let's get five or ten million, and let's move on. Yeah, I wish him all the best going forwards. Um, it's just that it's a really badly timed long-term injury. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say. We wish you all the best, Callum. Uh, I hope he, you know, magics it up and becomes a world-class player for us, hundred um, percent. Never happened. But the squad is different than it used to be, and roles and the right back position in particular have changed a lot. Mm-hmm. Right, thank you for listening. That's been North London's Most Read. We've made it 18 episodes now, and I hope you've enjoyed each and every one of them. I've been Jamie, and I've been with Kieran here. And hopefully, yeah. we'll have you come into the next game when we thrash Olympiacos, moving on to the Premier League and mounting a top four chase. I really, I really believe still that we can win the Europa League. I'm confident. I'm bullish on that. The Premier League, I'm not delusional. I understand the difficulties, and we literally have to play flawlessly, and everyone has to sort of treat the top four as lava, and if we're going to make it there... But, you know, there's no point not being optimistic. We can do well in the Premier League now for the last few games and then come in next season on a positive high. So that's what we need to do. That's what we need to keep doing. We need to support our team and go from there. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Thank you.